like to talk about coming to the Body Hacking Con when Trevor asked me to speak on sleep. Uh, I run a human potential medicine clinic in Asheville, North Carolina, and we focus on really kind of transforming and transcending human potential. So we look at individuals that we've stepped away from the disease model of medicine. We look at healthy individuals and we say, how can we create an optimal life, an epic life for people with all these advances that we have in medical technology, medical advances, um, medical science. I mean, we have pills that can make you smarter. We have technology that can work to enhance your body functions. And sleep is a big part of what we work with. And if we can't fix sleep, we find that we can't make, make it so that people can create that optimal life. One of the common things you hear is back in the words of uh, Warren Zevon, I'll sleep when I'm dead. I mean, how many of you find sleep as an inconvenience? Okay, yeah, most of you. Uh, sleep, though, sleep is really a big issue. You can live three minutes without air, three days without water, three months without food. Generally, we think you can live about 12 to 15 days without sleep. So most of you understand the importance of good nutrition in health, but you actually have sleep as a parameter that needs to be prioritized in order to be healthy. So in this lecture, I'm gonna actually go through some, some background as to why sleep is important, a little bit about sleep structure, then we're gonna get into some biohacks, uh, both of the tech biohacks I do a lot of genetics work, so I do a lot of genetic analysis uh, for sleep optimization, uh, nutrition optimization, um, and I do a lot of nootropics work. And if you stick around till the end, I just put up a brand new course on Udemy on nootropics. It's three hours of me talking about the different nootropics, herbals, uh, racetams, um, that whole group of uh, medicines that we're giving 88% off if you sign up by, uh, by Monday. Uh, so let's look at what sleep statistics shows. Uh, shift workers, I mean, chronic sleep deprivation shift workers it is a carcinogen. World Health Organization recognizes it. 24% increase in heart attacks, increased risk of cancers, diabetes, stroke. Uh, ten, 10 years of shift work will actually age your brain 16.5 years. And what's the biggest concern of people as they get older? It's loss of cognitive function when you look at the statistics and what people are worried about. When you're younger, you don't think about that, but as you start hitting those 40, 50 year olds, that's when they start recognizing the loss of cognitive function. Uh, NHTSA, the, the accidents associated with shift work uh, are pale in comparison to the statistics on sleep deprived drivers. There are actually more sleep deprived accidents than there are drunk driving accidents out there, especially the fatalities. Teens require nine hours of sleep, and 85% of them get less than eight. And there was a study done in Minnesota, the Adena School District, where they moved the start time an hour later. And what they found is that SAT uh, scores went up 200 points in those students. 200 points for getting an extra hour of sleep. Not only that, they found their quality of life went up, depression in the students went down, and their sports teams began winning. All of that by adding an extra hour of sleep. It's pretty cool stuff. This was also implemented uh, at Duke University. They moved their start times back an hour. State of Virginia actually implemented it throughout the entire state to help students. And they found what happens is you, you bump the time of start, but the kids still went to bed at the same time. So it really did give them 45 minutes to an hour extra of sleep. So there's different mechanisms involved, rest and repair, where we increase hormones, tissue repair. One and a half hours of sleep deprivation is a 32% reduction in alertness and memory. Uh, one and a half hours, that's it. And yet you're talking about people that generally sleep six to six and a half hours and eight is the requirement. So think about where you are in that category. Sleep deprivation, uh, for the guys in the room, here's an important reason to get your sleep, 50% reduction in testosterone, 50%. Direct association between sleep deprivation and Alzheimer's disease as well. Direct association. Lack of sleep over time, 
significant increase in risk of Alzheimer's. Look at this. Alcohol. If you lose two hours of sleep, it's the equivalent of having drank two to three beers. That's two hours lost. That's a six hour night for you. That's how you're going to function. Four hours, you're legally drunk. Weight loss. Six hours of sleep, you're prone to weight gain. Eight hours of sleep, people have the lowest body fat. Inflammation. Uh, life expectancy for people who sleep six hours or less is the same equivalent as a smoker, a chronic smoker. So are you sleep deprived? Do you need an alarm to get up in the morning? Do you have drowsiness when waking or during the day? Do you fall asleep in less than five minutes after you lay down at night? Those are all signs of chronic sleep deprivation. And what happens is we don't recognize it. We take micro sleeps, one to 30 seconds. This is where the driving accidents occur. What happens is when we're monitoring an EEG on somebody that's sleep deprived, and we do EEGs in our practice, we do quantitative EEGs on um, patients, you can see these micro sleeps happen and they're not even aware that it's happening to them. So if you don't recognize that you're sleepy, you're likely not to do anything about it. And that's what this statistic shows, is that days of sleep restriction, where you're losing sleep and your vigilance is measured, your vigilance deteriorates over time, but you can see over here that your perception of your sleep, sleeplessness doesn't rise on the same linear slope. It levels out. So we're not aware that we are actually sleep deprived. And that has implications. Perception is I can train my body to function on less sleep. The reality is you can teach your body to accept diminished levels of performance over time. That's important. So other purposes, energy conservation, restorative theory. There's a glymphatic system in the brain that Jeff Illiff talks about that they just recently discovered this. When we, most of our organs in our body have blood flow that goes to it to supply nutrients and to wash out the debris of metabolism, we have a lymphatic system. Brain doesn't have that. It only has the blood flowing in. The lymphatic system doesn't exist in the brain. And the brain is 20% of our metabolism in the day. So we have no drainage of all this debris of metabolism that's building up around our cells. And what happens is the only time that that fluid drains is when we sleep. And we know one of the things that drains is beta amyloid. What's beta amyloid? Alzheimer's disease. And we do know there's a direct correlation between lack of sleep and Alzheimer's disease. Uh, adenosine builds up. This is why you can't sleep until you avoid sleep until you die. Because adenosine is a chemical that builds up, it occupies receptors and causes you to fall asleep. Caffeine actually blocks the receptors for adenosine. They're washed out during the night and during the day we build them up and we get more and more tired. But caffeine can actually occupy the receptor sites and not allow binding of the adenosine. That's how caffeine works. Um, we also require sleep for learning purposes. You can't learn if you don't sleep. That's the time when the brain, what happens is the, the hippocampus in the brain gets all these files thrown into it during the day. And then when we sleep, the purpose of sleep is to actually take those files and put them into a filing cabinet and categorize them. If we don't do that, we lose all those files that we've created for the day. So sleep requirements, uh, teens, nine to 10 hours, adults, generally about seven and a half to eight and a half hours. Seven hours is still pushing it. This is sleep physiology. This is what happens. And you can see when we go to sleep, it takes about 90 minutes to get our first cycle of REM in. But as we get closer to morning, and this is going to be relevant later when I talk a little bit about lucid dreaming, but REM starts cycling faster and faster as we get closer to waking in the morning. This is just talking about the brainwave patterns that occur during sleep. The hormones that are involved. Now, uh, I bring this up because there's this, this is where we see a lot of problems like women on birth control pills can interfere with progesterone, menopausal females, estrogen dominance females. GABA is a natural tranquil, or progesterone is a natural tranquilizer for females, and hormonal changes can cause sleep issues. You get decreased REM, you get increased delta wave sleep. Uh, testosterone decreases syn synchronization when it's low. If you take benzodiazepines to help you sleep, you don't get REM. Alcohol, 
same thing, and you need REM, you have to have the REM cycles or you don't get the quality of sleep. You may sleep eight hours, but you get like five hours of quality out of it. So it's not worth uh, using that as a sleep uh, inducer. A lot of people will take serotonin, but serotonin is a stimulant as well as a relaxer. So you have to see how your body responds to it. So what we do is we put people through a sleep hygiene. We put them on regular schedules. Uh, we have them go to bed at the same time every night for 30 days, get up at the same time for 30 days. We have them uh, black out the room, increase light exposure during the day, uh, eliminate artificial light, cool the room down. These are all basic lifestyle hacks that you can do to help boost sleep quality and induction of sleep. So for us, the bed has two purposes. Sleep and sex, get the TV out of the bedroom, number one. And 70% of us put our cell phones next to the bed. And if you actually look at your cell phone right before bed, it reduces your quality of sleep by 67%. Just one glance at that screen. Now some people actually have blue blockers on their screen, which actually helps, but it's still uh, a bit of an issue. Um, Mindset with sleep. Mindset's important too. Uh, do you wake up in the morning like it's Christmas morning? How many of you wake up that way? All excited when you get up, ready to go. That's awesome. That's the way I am. Uh, you want to have a day like that. I haven't, I haven't used an alarm in probably eight or nine months. I just wake up. And I'm excited to wake up and start my day. I have a routine I do in the morning. I have four hours before I have to go to work. So I have basically from 5 to 9 a.m. that I can do whatever I want. I work out, I sit in the hot tub, I meditate. Uh, and it has really made a huge difference for me. And my clients, when I have them do this, it really works well too. Nutrition is important. And I could do an entire lecture on the nutrition that boosts sleep. Um, but it's just basically healthy human nutrition and exercise as well. So the lifestyle biohacks, blacking out the room, uh, light has a huge influence on circadian rhythms. Prior to the uh, light bulb, we slept 10 hours on average. Uh, there was also a thing called second sleep that could occur where we woke up about midway through the night, people would get up, have conversations, have sex, and go back to sleep. Our sleep routines have changed dramatically since the advent of light. Um, blue light. Blue light is a real problem. It decreases melatonin secretion by 71%. This is what happens with the smartphones. So if you're gonna have the smartphone in the room, don't look at it or get some blue blockers. You can use amber bulbs in the room. Um, night lights should all have amber bulbs in them. Because uh, if you get up to go to the bathroom and you turn the light on, you're gonna turn off melatonin and turn on cortisol. It's gonna be hard to get back to sleep or at least get good quality sleep after that. Uh, you can get the, the uh, blue filtered glasses, you can get blue tech lenses if you have prescriptions, they're expensive lenses, but you can also go to the hardware store and buy the yellow glasses and they work just as well filtering the light. Uh, F.Lux is a program you can get on your computer, on your phone, on your iPad, the free program, and it will take out the blue light. Works really well for that. Um, so if you are somebody that has to look at your, your devices, get the F.Lux. Um, temperature. Lowering the temperature in the room will help you to get to sleep. Body naturally cools when it goes to sleep, and if you help it along that way, it will actually accelerate the process. Now, how about power naps? Uh, I'm gonna get into a little bit of these, these really awesome sleep hacks that people do, but I can tell you they're hard to maintain. A 20 to 30 minute nap will get you into stage two. So it's really good for alertness, motor skills. Um, and generally you don't have any grogginess when you come out of it because you haven't gotten into the deeper stages of sleep. But it will boost your afternoon alertness and motor skills. If you wanna go 30 to 60 minutes, you get stage two and start getting into a little bit of the deeper sleep. This is really good for improving decision making and verbal memory. So if you've learned something in the morning, this is a good one to utilize to help uh, move that into a more permanent storage. A 60 to 90 minute nap is where you first start to get into the RAM in the, in the nap. Uh, it is the only one that you can truly use to compensate for sleep deprivation. So if you're sleep deprived, taking a 20 minute nap isn't gonna help you any. If you take a 60 to 90 minute nap, you can generally boost that a little bit. Um, 
and that's assuming that you get into REM during that time, but you get improved brain connections, improved problem solving when you utilize this kind of a napping protocol. Anybody here do polyphasic sleep? Yeah, it's not common. Everybody thinks that they want to try this, and I can tell you I've had conversations with people that have tried polyphasic sleep, and it is absolutely miserable for them. Um, the everyman polyphasic sleep is taking 20 to 30 minute naps, um, and by taking those naps, you can actually take off almost an hour of poor sleep at night. So they'll sleep four hours at night, and then they'll take two or three naps during the day to compensate for it. Uh, they don't have to be on strict schedule as the Uberman. Uberman sleep, um, I followed a guy that was doing a month getting into Uberman sleep and he thought he was gonna die. It was the most miserable process getting into it. And, but he did, and he, it worked for him. He basically took six naps that were 20 to 30 minutes each over a 24 hour period. It's all he needed for sleep. And he was functioning fine, except he had no social life. He said, nobody is on this schedule. I can't even get online with people in, in this time frame. He said, if I couldn't go out with people because I'd go out and I'd say, you know what, I gotta go take a nap. Every four hours, he was <laughs> taking a nap. But he did it for a year. He, he actually maintained it. Um, but we all think that we have this ability to, to maintain shorter sleep. I say um, about 1% of the population has the genetic variation that allows for short sleep about five to six hours but I can tell you of my clients that come to see me 90% of them think they have it <laughs> and I guarantee you I'm not getting that population that's only that 1% group um, but everybody thinks that they can function on less sleep because their body has learned to accept lower function once you start getting eight hours of sleep you will be amazed at what you can accomplish your productivity doubles. Your ability to imagine and be creative goes through the roof. I mean, just do 30 days of it and you will see the difference. So what about assessment tools on sleep? Um, most of what we're dealing with right now are motion detectors. Uh, the Fitbits, the, the devices that sit by the bed that, that monitor that, all they're doing is monitoring motion and it's not a very accurate measure. So. Don't rely too heavily on, on the technology that's out there right now. The only reliable technology is gonna be an EEG and trying to wear EEGs while you sleep, not pleasant either. Um, but those are the only ones that are gonna really tell you what's going on. Uh, a lot of the sleep studies that are done on uh, stuff like uh, inducing uh, transcranial uh, direct current stimulation to help with lucid dreaming and things like that, you have to have somebody monitoring you to turn the thing on at the right time in order to help induce the lucid dreaming. So it's really only done in the labs. They are working on technology that can be a little bit more accurate this day. So lucid dreaming, uh, you, are you all familiar with what lucid dreaming is? Lucid dreaming is basically where you actually control the dream, where you can control what happens in the dream. And it's a technique that a lot of people practice and learn, and it's, it's, really, uh, it's really an awesome thing to do. Uh, some of the things that they do is the WBTB, which is wake back to bed, so they wake up. Some of them will stay up for 60 minutes, uh, so they wake up towards morning, maybe an hour or two before their normal waking period, and then they'll stay up for 30 to 60 minutes and then go back to bed. Uh, that is one of the techniques that they can use to help remember the dreams, they'll write them down. It takes a lot of practice to, to get good at lucid dreaming. Um, the wild technique, wake initiated lucid dreaming, is basically you wake up and you try to take yourself back into the dream and control, control it, but you just have to practice that. Now there are nootropics that can actually boost lucid dreaming, but it doesn't supplant the fact that you still have to practice it. So the aniracetam is really good about boosting lucid dreaming, but galantamine, amazing for lucid dreaming. The people that I have seen on Reddit that have used galantamine have had great results with it. Um, the galantamine though, the problem is it's, it's a short half-life and you have to take it like midway through the night. So you have to wake up and take it and then rely on it to kick in. So you've got to figure out how to wake yourself up to, to take the galantamine and get the, uh, the induction of the lucid dreaming. But you still have to practice the, uh, the techniques along with that. 
but it's a pretty cool process. Uh, I would love to lose a dream. I just don't want to wake myself up to do it. So in my practice, we do uh, a lot of uh, QEG work. We do neurofeedback training. And what we have found is that you can actually alter brainwave patterns. You can change permanently someone's brainwave patterns. Okay, that can be good and bad. You can create some really bad stuff with this, or you can create some really awesome stuff with it. Here's the catch. What you see here is a QEG, so they are basically comparing a brainwave pattern to a normative database. So they're comparing it to normal people. And so if they say, well, you're abnormal here, and you're abnormal here, so if we work on bringing those down, we're going to make you normal. Who wants to be normal? That's not the goal. The goal is to be superhuman. We want to be able to enhance brain function. We don't have a database right now to compare that to. So you have to have somebody who truly understands these brainwave patterns to say, oh, you've got some really awesome activity here. Let's try to enhance that. Uh, even though it may show up abnormal on a cue, uh, it may be really desirable to have. So we're actually working with uh, a, a neurofeedback expert uh, that is in the process of developing a database of superhumans. So these people that are really top performers, what does their brainwave pattern look like? That's what we want to achieve. We don't want to bring super performers down to normal. We just create a, a normal society, which is not what we want. We do psychophysiologic stress profiles. So we see how the brain kind of responds to stress. When we take the stressor away, we see if what's left. So we look at muscle tension, skin conductance, heart rate variability, carbon dioxide. Um, so we get a really good read on the physiology of a person. Um, and you know, this is just a typical QEG brain tracing. That's what they take and they make into those pretty colored pictures for us. We do a lot of heart rate variability monitoring. Um, you guys familiar with heart rate variability, heart math device? Uh, yeah, it's a great tool for sleep, let me tell you. Um, you work on heart rate variability, you get practiced at it, and it's not something you can just do periodically. It's like trying to run a marathon and run once a month doesn't work. You gotta do this regularly to help create this response that you wanna have. So heart rate variability is an excellent technique. It's cheap and it's very effective. Uh, we've used it in our medical practice for several years and have had great responses with the people who truly train at this. Um, and you can have it on your iPhone, you can have a handheld device, you can use a computer-based device. I really like the computer-based device, but it's like 300 bucks. You can get the iPhone piece for uh, $125, but it takes you through meditation. I mean, it's, it's wonderful. Um, this is the one I like. Um, I like the Muse headset. And I saw some of you guys were using the Muse downstairs. Um, I interviewed uh, Ariel Garden, the CEO, on my podcast. That's her right there. Uh, she's an amazing woman. They're working on using this. It's an open source device, so you can create software for it. But they're working on stuff in her company to actually monitor you throughout the day and monitor brainwave responses to things in your environment. Uh, so what's kind of cool about it is you can find out who in your environment makes you feel good from a brain standpoint. And you can eliminate the people who make you feel bad. So, I can't hang out with you, here's why. Uh, but this is a this is a kind of a neurofeedback training because what it does is it measures how calm the brain is. So it's really measuring alpha alpha state, and it gives you birds. So you hear these little birds chirp in the background. It's neurofeedback training. The brain hears the birds, and even though you're cognitively hearing the birds and thinking, "Oh, that's good, that's good," the brain is hearing it too, and the brain's learning alpha state is a cool state to be in. I'm getting rewarded here. I'm getting birds. Okay, and then you hear the birds fly away when you go up into beta, it's, you hear them and you're like, oh man. But you compete to actually get how much calm and uh, how many birds you get, you get awards. Um, one of my nurses did it and she got like 7% calm and she got an award and I was like, what's that? And it's like a participation award she got. So she got like nothing on it. Um, but I love the, the alpha training with the, uh, with the Muse headset. I highly recommend that one. Uh, we also use the Versus headset to train calm. Um, and all of this comes into play with being able to bring that brain down into that alpha state. That's the first stage of sleep. 
So that's what we're working on with this. And not only is it a good meditation piece, but it's bringing the brain into a state that can create calm. And the versus headset is neurofeedback training as well. And uh, it's, it's what, about $600 for the versus? What is it called? Versus, V-E-R-S-U-S. V -E -R -S -U -S. Uh, we've been working with the company to develop a more clinically based device. They use it for sports teams right now, so you can improve your golf game or your football. Um, but you can work on focus or stress or calm. There's all kinds of things that will show you when it does its initial assessment. Another thing that we use a lot of is uh, audiovisual entrainment. Does anybody here do that? It's pretty awesome stuff, isn't it? AV entrainment, um, I, I'm not a huge fan. It doesn't work great for me, but for most people it works really wonderful for. Uh, it's basically you wear the glasses and you're seeing visual cues and you wear the headphones and you'll hear like binaural beats and other things that are going to entrain wave patterns in the brain. And you can set it for the kind of pattern that you want to create in the brain. So you're not actually doing anything physically. You're allowing this to create these brainwave patterns. And for a lot of people, this works wonderful. There's, uh, uh, there's the, uh, the Schumann resonance, which is the, the Earth's resonant frequency. That's kind of the flow state. You have the, uh, the alpha state training. You have theta state training from meditation. So you can actually create these, these uh, montages that will help to get the brain into the wave patterns that really work well. Uh, this, is the, this is the new generation of things, is, is creating these brain wave patterns. We're very young in the infancy of it, and there's a lot of unknowns right now, so it's a lot of biohacking in this area um, of trying to alter brain wave states. And that brings us into the electrophysiology tech. This is really the, this is really the edgy stuff, okay? This is stuff that I don't recommend playing with, okay? I know about brainwave physiology. I know about electrical activity in the brain. Some of this stuff is a little scary to be playing with because you can go on YouTube and find out how to make your own transcranial direct current stimulator. Don't recommend doing that. Um, we've been using electrical stimulation since the Roman times. They used these fish that they would stick on to... Um, to uh, uh, the Roman emperors for pain relief. It was basically a TENS unit that they were using the fish for. Um, and they were using it for pain relief, they were using it for fatigue, they were using it for a lot of things. So electrical stimulation's been around a long time. And you know, we have these devices now, like the focus unit, um, the slit, I forget which unit this is, but these are all different units that create different electrical stimulations to the brain, and those electrical stimulations really change brain waves. This isn't just one of those things that, oh, I'm gonna try this or something. You are truly changing brain wave patterns through electrical stimulation. Um, the, the TVCS is this continuous current, the TRNS is like this chaotic current, and the TACS is the alternating current. Uh, so there's a lot of new technology coming on. There's some research on this, but it is relegated to the research world right now. I would let them work on this to perfect it before you start doing it on yourself. Um, now, this is the study that everybody hears about, though. This was the DARPA study on U.S. snipers, training snipers. And the red is the snipers that were using TDCS during their training. The blue were using sham stimulation. It tripled their, tr their learning curve. And everybody that is out there is quoting this study. They don't quote the study that came after it that said there is a cost to the learning. And what they found is that automaticity in these people dropped dramatically. So they increased their learning curve, but they dropped their automaticity, so their ability to actually implement it automatically. It was a major sacrifice, so it comes with a cost. So if you hear people promoting, oh man, this, this increases learning, you can do it. It does. It does great with increasing learning. You can learn a language faster by doing this if you do it the right way. But you're going to lose something in the process. So I would not play with it. Uh, this new device is the Think device. I don't know if you've heard about it, but it works a little differently. It stimulates muscles and nerves. 
to the trigeminal nerve that feeds into the brain, so it does it to, to create calm states through that, through muscle tension, through a nerve stimulation peripherally. It's not actually creating a current in the brain, but it, it seems to be working pretty well. Uh, it's T-H-Y-N-C is the company. Uh, we've been using electrical stimulation on the brain, and I can tell you, I've done this. I did this in my first years of uh, medical school uh, on patients, is the electroconvulsive therapy. I've actually held the paddles on someone's head and shocked them, and it worked. It works great. It is still a good technique. It's just you have to put them under anesthesia to do it. And so it's, it has to be repeated over time and time again. But we know electrical stimulation works. Now, this is uh, transcranial uh, magnetic stimulation, which is something that is still is kind of in the research room, but it works really well too. It's adding these magnetic currents to the surface of the head that actually changes brainwave patterns. Uh, they are using it for calm and sleep and things like that as well. Something that we work with a lot is the neurotransmitters. And this is where we start getting into the chemical. We've talked about electrical. Let's talk about chemical ways to alter the brain and to create this. Um, we look at the neurochemicals in the brain predominantly through genetics. So we look at the ability to create dopamine, serotonin, how it breaks down in the brain, and all these colored areas are genes that are involved in that, which we can easily check. We have the clock gene. The clock gene, uh, and you can get this. How many of you have had 23andMe done? Now, you can look this up. If you have the RSID code and you go into your genetic raw data, you can actually search these. So you, all you do is type in RS1801260 and you look at the alleles that you have. In 23andMe, the C will actually be a G. So if you have GG, you have decreased sleep requirement. You do have increased nervous activity in the evenings, though, so you have trouble getting to sleep, but you have decreased sleep requirements. Uh, AANAT, delayed onset of sleep. DEC2 is a familial natural short sleeper. Six and a half hours for a CG, six hours for a GG. PER2 is the morning lark. These are people that tend to go to bed about four hours before the average person. <laughs> They get up really early. That's their routine. That's programmed in their genes. A, B, C, C, 9. Uh, short sleeper if they have a G. They're a prolonged sleeper if they have the A. And various other ones that, um, that create different responses. But these are all related to the, um, the genetics. In genetics, we now have the human blueprint. And 23andMe actually codes for 635,000 of your genes. They don't tell you this. I actually access them on the backside. I load them up into templates. You can download your raw data. It's right there in a text file. And you have 635,000 genes. You don't have to ever have the test again because you can always have that text file. That's you. It's not going to change. And you can load it up into new templates. You can always check a new gene that comes along. Uh, so we create templates for nutrition, for exercise, for supplementation, for sleep. So you can actually create these um, and find out what makes you you. It's basically creating an instruction manual for you. It, I always say that the clients that come to us, we teach them how to breathe. We teach them how to walk. We teach them how to sleep. We teach them how to eat. Because from a human standpoint, we didn't have an instruction manual. We're basically a vehicle for our consciousness, so this is a vehicle that carries our consciousness. And we are limited by what this vehicle is capable of, and we also have to run this vehicle in a way that's intended. You watch people, they don't know how to function in their own bodies. You see the kids that are walking around like this, and, and they're walking like they've got something stuck up their butt or whatever it is, but they don't know how to move. And they don't lack, or they lack confidence because of their, their postures. You change their postures, suddenly they become more confident. Uh, if you haven't read the book by Amy Cuddy called Presence, it's a really good book. just came out in December. But it's all about this, the way the body feeds back to the brain and changes the brain function. So this is like a sample of a template that I use to look at genes. All right, nootropics. How many of you guys are kind of playing with nootropics? All right, several of you. 
Yeah, this is a, this is one of those areas that you have to kind of play with because nobody can tell you what is going to create something. You have to try it and see if it works for you. Uh, anybody take Fenibut? Help you sleep? It's wonderful, isn't it? Fenibut is a go-to for all of our people that can't sleep very well. Um, I like it because it's really a, even though it's a research chemical, uh, it still works in a very natural way because it goes directly to the GABA receptor. Uh, GABA, if you take GABA, GABA doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier in most cases, it's too big. But Fenibut does, and it goes across and it actually stimulates the, the GABA receptor directly and, uh, and creates a response. There's also a little bit of dopamine stimulation, so there's also a positive feeling with it, so you get a, a kind of a good feeling. Trouble is, if you take too much of it, you can wake up really groggy, um, but it will knock you out. It's, it's pretty potent. Now, um, I like to stack things. When I'm working with people for nootropics for a purpose, I like to stack them because that way you don't have to use too much of one. You can bring them together to get a amplified response. So you can use something like lactium. Lactium is actually a derivative of the casein protein. Um, but lactium is a GABA receptor stimulator as well. Um, theanine, L-theanine, actually works in a different way, but it increases the available neurotransmitter GABA. And then lemon balm inhibits GABA transaminase, so it limits the breakdown. So you take theanine, which increases the levels of GABA, and you take lemon balm that stops the breakdown of the GABA, works really great together. You don't have to take excessive doses of either one. But I've had really awesome responses with just lemon balm alone, uh, just fenibut alone. But when you combine them, you can get some really good responses with it. We'll also have people put like lavender on their pillow. Lavender, um, there's, a, there's a good book, I can't think of the name of it. Uh, Scott, <coughs> Scott Johnson wrote it about, um, about um, essential oils. And he did a lot of epigenetic work on the essential oils and lavender was a really awesome one for inducing changes in the, in the body for sleep. Um, so speaking of nootropics, I launched a nootropics course yesterday on uh, Udemy. Udemy is a public uh, site where you can get education. The course is normally $197, but for people here today, 88% off. Uh, if you use the code body hacking or you just follow that, uh, that RC code, um, it'll be available at that price until Monday if you use the code. Um, but it's three hours of me talking about the different nootropics. Uh, talk about sleep, I talk about all the racetams, talk about uh, a bunch of herbals. Um, but it's kind of good timing that we finished it uh, just before coming here. Um, so the path forward. Um, what, what are the next steps in this human potential optimization, especially when we're talking about sleep? We've got to come up with really a better way to assess sleep. Assessing sleep is more subjective right now. So identifying the different ways that we can actually look at sleep and say this is good quality sleep, this is not good quality sleep. Um, we're not there yet, and like I said, it's, right now the best thing we can do is, is EEG monitoring. Uh, you want to set your own goals for this though. So you say, okay, what do I want to achieve? I want to achieve sleeping. If you're only sleeping six hours, let's set a goal for seven hours for the next two weeks and set your clocks uh, or set your time to say, I'm gonna to go to bed at this time, I'm getting up at this time. Body likes routine. Body is all about rhythms. There's ultradian rhythms, there's circadian rhythms. Body likes rhythms. And if you don't go to sleep on a regular schedule, it has no idea what it's supposed to do. It's all messed up and it just says, forget it, I'm, I'm done. I'm not gonna give you melatonin because I don't know when you're gonna to go to bed, okay? I'm gonna raise cortisol because you're looking at a light in the middle of the night. You mess it up with, with a lot of these lifestyle things that you can really just make minor changes and, and create that. And then reassess what kind of success you're having with it. Document this stuff, write it down. Um, John Lee Dumas, uh, anybody know him, Entrepreneur on Fire? He just came out with a book called uh, uh, The Freedom Journal. And it's a 100 day journal that's really awesome. It's an amazing journal. Tells you something you do in the morning, you write down the stuff in the morning, you write down the stuff in the evening to assess how your day was. Guides you right through it. Um, but it's for like people who wanna write a book, it's for people who wanna lose weight, it's for people who wanna start a new job. It's really amazing how well it works uh, for 
goals like sleep or weight loss or anything like that. And then after you reassess and you say, okay, well, this is working, this isn't working, try something else. If it's not working, focus on something else, change it. You know, the fenibut isn't working, let's try some lemon balm. Uh, let's try meditation, let's try alpha wave training. Alpha wave training's not working, let's try heart rate variability training. Because everybody's different in what they respond to and there isn't something I can say, this works for everybody. It just doesn't, it's like the diet. I mean, I used to be a, a bariatric surgeon. I used to do weight loss surgery, 10 years of it. Did 3,000 gastric bypass operations. And I also did weight loss during that time. And I walked away from it in December of 2009. I had an awesome career. I was making seven digit income. And I said, you know what, this doesn't work. Walked out of the OR on December 31st and said, I'm not coming back, I was done. And it was because I realized that everything I was doing was useless. It did not work. Human potential is individualized. And the Human Genome Project has helped to open my eyes to this. I mean, human genome mapping is as big as the man walking on the moon. It just hasn't gotten that attention that it should. I mean, we truly have your own blueprint. We have you. You as a unique individual, we know exactly what makes you you. And we can do things that can create awesome outcomes just based on you as the individual. Um, that is personalized medicine at its best. And we have it, but we've been ignoring it. And now it's time to pay attention to it.